Welcome to Tech Talk. I'm your host, Lauren Keim, with the prestigious Goodman Center for Real Estate at Lea University. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. For those of you who've been following our events and our videos, uh, there have been two major areas that have dominated our conversations recently. And those include, of course, the impact of the pandemic uh, on commercial investment real estate and some of the rapid changes in technology that are affecting the industry, hopefully in a positive way. Today, we're going to bring both those subjects together as we talk a bit about distressed assets and technology. Particularly, we're looking at the, the online auction and the virtual deal room platforms that are impacting the market and bringing some investment real estate to a broader audience than perhaps just local pool of investors. Major players have scrambled to incorporate auctions and secure information sharing technology into their platforms. Uh, as you know, probably Crexi, the commercial real estate exchange, has intr introduced their auction platform. And of course, CoStar purchased 10X. But really, the 800 pound gorilla of the online transaction marketplace has been a company called Real Capital Markets, or RCM. RCM has executed over 72,000 transactions, totaling over $2.4 trillion in business. For those commercial transactions over $10 million, over 50% of them are brought to market using RCM's online marketplace. In fact, RCM powers uh, CBRE's deal flow and has large enterprise agreements with firms like Cushman and Wakefield and Colliers. And I believe, or at least I hope anyway, that a, uh, a deal is being inked with Rheology for Century 21 commercial shortly and many other players in the marketplace. RCM recently became part of Lightbox, an organization that has been putting together all the pieces of the CRE puzzle and building a platform they say is going to rival uh, or at least be the uh, real estate equivalent to services like S&P, Thomson Reuters, and Bloomberg. So having said all that, I want to bring on Justin Latore, and actually I just butchered your name, didn't I? I apologize for that. The Managing uh, Director of Auction <laughs> Services at Lightbox. He has a wealth of CRE experience being involved in over a billion dollars of value-add investment real estate transactions and having held uh, several very prominent positions throughout the industry. I can go on with that for probably 10 minutes. Justin, I'm going to let you uh, run with the ball for a bit, but uh, tell us more about Real Capital Markets, uh, what you think is going to happen with the CRE auction market, and perhaps how the, the next cycle, the next phase in this market may create some opportunities and some challenges. And welcome. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, a wonderful intro, and I appreciate it. I, I respond to uh, Justin Latour as well as Justin Latouri, so I get I get plenty of. So. Um, but yeah, things are great. I think we're you know in this in, inflection point right now in the market. If we all think back to um, you know the 2008 2009 time frame, in fact, in that cycle there was about a four year hold on on transactions. So uh, relatively. We're doing great, you know, as, as a whole, and not just Lightbox, not just our real capital markets. I think that we're we're um, really in a position to rebound much faster. You know, if we think back and we sort of kind of inject adjust the position, and we think about how the first real CMBS loan, if you really, if you remember, this was in the, the really the late 2012. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about the capital markets opening up again, I just heard recently that there was a a large, almost like two billion dollars CMBS loan that was being uh, that was going in uh, to uh, into bidding for bondholders so uh, really interesting times right I mean we've been through what seems to be a, a massive change I know at real capital markets we're still working remotely I work remotely anyway I'm uh, I'm here in Miami and most of the folks are out in California uh, real, real capital markets as a part of Lightbox is located in Carlsbad um, uh, California so uh, things are going well with us we're really we are part and parcel of the market. I think, you know, we've got, uh, we actually powered Cush Wakefield's uh, Capital Markets website as well as uh, Collier's. So, you know, we're deeply ingrained and in, in with our partners, the, uh, the brokers in the business. Um, on the real capital market side, we've been around 20 years, right? So it's been a, it's been a long-term uh, real love affair with brokers. That's our main focus. So um, a little bit of background too, and around 2013, C3 bought the company. Uh, and, and really looked to leverage the online auction platform uh, and did. Sold about 600 assets for about two and a half uh, billion, not trillion, uh, in, in assets. But we have done two and a half trillion uh, relatively on the real capital markets chassis. So what's interesting about that is that really our platform is unique in the way that it's basically built by servicers for servicers and institutions. And then with me joining the firm, what I've done is really kind of um, 
turned it around and made it taken all that great data, which is some of the best clients for brokers. And I've really turned uh, the screws to make it a such a broker friendly platform. It's got so, so many great tools. Um, and where I'm coming from and where my team is coming from is always looking at how we, we best serve our core client. Right. And so uh, we can kind of go into a little bit, if you like, Lauren, around what Lightbox is doing uh, more broadly and then kind of bring it back down to what we're doing here at Real sure. Capital Markets, if that works for you. That'd be great. They've got some interesting stuff. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's really become more or less a, a roll up per se to use like a kind of a market term of companies that are um, really providing the back end workflow for commercial real estate. So there's some, excuse me, there's a few things that <clears throat> I learned when joining the team that I thought were really impressive. So we kind of put out there that we have about 1100 banking clients. Excuse me, a little tea will help. <clears throat> there we go. Um, so what's really interesting about that is how there are clients. So we really are the software backend for them to, to communicate with regulators. With regulators. So when you're thinking about, say, as uh, a customer who wants to know what's going on out in the marketplace, we're actually providing a lot of that data. Now it's not that we can share all that data. I'm not saying that, but the relationships are, are there and deep within uh, banks, their workout division, uh, their valuation divisions. So I think that we're really going to be in a, a great position to uh, gain an up, a, a forward lead in, in really what's going on from an information standpoint. Similarly, um, <coughs> inopportune costs. Huh? Uh, the, so we're about 70% of the appraisal market, uh, basically 70% of appraisals, we are the backbone software that puts that through to banks, right? So, and the same thing goes with engineering reports. So what's interesting is we're, we're involved in so many, so much of the transaction all the way through. And I really, I think that's going to be a strategic advantage for us and our clients kind of moving forward. Got it. On the real capital market side, as you mentioned earlier, um, that we're just doing a lot of transactions annually and we're working with the best brokers in the business. And so uh, when you kind of roll all that stuff together, we're, we're this back end piece that's, that's like we're not forward facing. So a lot of the, I say a lot of these things because, in fact, I don't know that we do the best job of explaining it this way uh, to the broader market. So when you say so. that uh, real capital markets is involved in half of the deals that are over $10 million. How does that actually play out? Uh, brokers in the past, one of the, the challenges or one of the complaints about some of the larger brokerages over time has been that so much of the data is hidden that you don't know that a, uh, a certain asset is for sale until it's already under agreement. How does this transpire? How does it work? Well, look, there's still some of that, right? I think that um, that's not just driven by brokers. A lot of sellers want it that way. And so our platform provides that kind of uh, the kind of optionality for a broker to not only decide who it's going to go out to, uh, but uh, when and what those people can see, right? And I think that that's sort of a, that has been the way that the market has worked in, in grand total. But on the auction side, it, it's really an opportunity to democratize that process. And it's one of my favorite pieces of being in the auction business. So um, just, you know, my background, the way that I kind of look at it is I got into the commercial real estate and finance industry about 15 years ago. Um, and had a lot of great success as a young broker going into the, the, uh, the downturn, I realized that there was a need for equity and debt in the market differently than we have today. It was much different back then. And I spent a lot of time raising capital and placing capital uh, into deals and then ended up at 10X really running uh, the Southeast for about uh, five years for them, right? And so I've learned a lot about you know, how auctions work, how to uh, bring things out to market on, on a grand scale. And so what I look to do here at, at Lightbox uh, on a national scale is really take a lot of those wins and, and, apply, and apply that to our process. And a lot of that is, is, the, is really what you're pointing at, Lauren, is the democratization of deal flow, getting deals in front of every buyer that should have a look at them um, and, and really allowing the auction allows money to speak first, right? So for every deal, Part of the uh, process is that the buyer first does their diligence and what we would determine like as a marketing period, right? We launch the project and then there'll be an auction date out in the future. So they have access to all this great data. We can go into some of that in a few minutes, but 
you know, so they they're when they join the auction, the terms and conditions that they agree to have them saying, hey, I've done my diligence. I'm a sophisticated buyer. Uh, and I think that's important because that puts everyone basically on the same playing field from a, a, a diligence level. And then part of the next part of uh, the registration process is that once they've agreed to the terms and conditions, it's showing proof of funds. So uh, why I think that's important is in a traditional transaction, what's, what's tough is you have unknown companies or known companies that are making offers and you don't really know that everybody's in the same position, right? Well, within the auction, you know, anybody who's bidding against you is in a, in a situation where they've shown their proof of funds and we're all playing uh, in a way where we know everyone can execute, right? So I think that's really important around, you know, not only the execution of it, but letting every, setting up a fair uh, game board, if you want to call it that. Have you done any research as to whether this gets a, a higher number for the client or a lower number for the client? I mean, auctions historically have uh, been a challenge for some, um, some sellers because auctions historically haven't done as well as a typical marketing period and, and uh, attracting buyers that way. However, with this type of platform, of course, we're seeing bidders all over the world, like you were saying, that are all going after the same assets. And some, uh, some may be willing to buy at, let's say, a lower cap rate than somebody who's already in that market area. That's right. So uh, importing capital, as I like to call it, right? right? So bringing in capital from not only you know different markets here domestically, but internationally. Uh, and you know, I think look, some of the challenges that we're I'm looking to sort of iron out over time here is looking at say, okay, why is there just maybe a discrepancy on pricing in an auction? Mainly, it comes down to um, I think control around the deal. The typical cadence for a buyer is to go to contract and then conduct significant diligence once they have control of the asset. So we're sort of turning that on its head. So there's there's always going to be some, in a sense, repercussions for that. So one of the one of the ways that we offset some of the risk for the buyer is we go ahead and order third party reports, meaning a full phase one and a property condition report up front, so that it's included in the data vault for them to use and you know, from a quality standpoint, we're using uh, the top firms in the nation to do that from an engineering, uh, the, on the engineering side. So that it's sort of like household names in that industry, right? But like for us right now, our lead, our lead vendor is uh, EBI mm -hmm. uh, and they're great, right? So um, we look to have a data vault that's fully built out so that a buyer doesn't feel like they need to discount the deal for something they don't know. Because I don't know about you, Lauren, most, uh, most of the ideas I had prior to really getting into the online auction space is that most auctions were either held in a dark courtroom or on the courthouse steps. And sure. you got very limited information and you were expected to you know, commit uh, very heavily, as you are with us. Look, if you win right. the auction, the expectation is you sign the contract you know, the day you win and you submit your earnest money, which is typically 10% uh, the following day. So... Uh, um... Actually, somebody had a question online. Uh, do the do you have auctions outside the United States, particularly in the Bahamas? They're asking, but and I love that question. It's it's uh, really well timed. We're actually going to we do that first of all. Quick answer is yes, uh, and I've got uh, several deals that we're working on um, in in Canada, which is most for, it's still international, even though we're sort we're connected to them. Uh, and then I have another deal in uh, in Gila that that we're looking at to take out here shortly. Uh, so, so you will start to see some work from us in the islands. We've actually done a considerable amount of work in the islands in Central America uh, to the tune of about at least 100 land deals. This happens to be a land deal that uh, I'm working on and many more assets other than that. So that's also unique. We're, uh, we're, I think we're the only auction house in um, domestically that is doing international auctions at this time. And you said that you, you feel that... Uh the changes in the marketplace are going to lead to more auctions. Uh, I'm expecting that what you're talking about is distressed assets coming on the market since everything's been in a holding pattern since the first quarantines hit. Exactly, right? And so there's going to be, um, whether it was deals that had an issue going into, to, or kind of weak going into uh, COVID, I think there's also going to be this, this next kind of shoe to drop, which is, it's just a natural progression, right? Like it's not, um, I don't want to be, uh, the grave dancer or anything in that way. It's just that this is a natural kind of cycle uh, type of deal. And look, we're going into, if you're, you're starting to hear more about receivership deals, that's very natural, very normal part of the cycle as you go through this 
maybe it's a bump in the cycle or maybe it's a full uh, a full sort of uh, downturn cycle. We'll see. have to see how it works out. But you start to hear about receivership deals. So that's been on the rise in a big way. You start to hear about bankruptcies. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And th th that's on the rise as well. January is a big month, uh, I think, for overall uh, uh, bankruptcy, not necessarily with CRE owners, but you know, businesses. Um, and then we're going to look to, I think, towards year end as FASB kind of goes back into full effect and banks are, need to mark to market. It seems as though, and, and what I'm hearing and speaking to a lot of leading folks in, in the loan sales business, that you know, third and fourth quarter, we should see a lot more activity there. Will it be as much as all these distressed funds want? Uh, maybe, but, but maybe not, right? So we'll have to see how that all plays out. Uh, but it's a pretty large market. And when you start uh, looking at historicals, on uh, like we were talking about uh, earlier, Lauren, the, when you look historically, it's actually a very low charge off rate. And there's like there's spikes along the way. And then it comes back down to normal. And in the last few years, I mean, darn, it's been zero. So it was actually negative one quarter, negative charge offs. I mean, yeah, I'm not even sure I really understand that, but it's all FDIC data. So it uh, should right. be pretty good. <laughs> well, you actually, you had some data you brought with you that you were going to show us as well. Sure. So I get into that there. Hit this. Uh... So here's you know where we're looking at mainly from our perspective, we see a really great opportunity to uh, when I say opportunity, what I, I guess what I mean is an opportunity to to look at where maybe the holes are in all of this. So banking and thrift has about one and a half trillion dollars out in commercial real estate. Now it's actually higher. This is really a year end stat. Um, and, and, you know, agencies, the agencies have almost 100%, it's not quite, it's probably like 90, 85% market share in uh, multifamily lending in this cycle, which is much different than the last cycle where the CMBS kind of ruled the roost there. Sure, but I, so I, I assume a ton multifamily of is not going to have as many problems as you're going to see in other uh, uh, asset classes. I would agree, which is why I don't have a big yellow box around it. Uh, but I do think that there's going to be uh, those yellow boxes are mine, by the way. So I, and this, and a lot of my slides are not the prettiest because I'm not a designer, but they are effective and have some good information in them. The, uh, the agencies uh, are going to have, you know, look, there's about 60 to $70 billion in back rent that's out there that needs to be kind of spoken for. Uh, I think in general, most of the multi guys I'm talking to feel like they're going to kind of move forward from that and not necessarily be able to really look back on a year's worth of delinquent payments from, from any given tenant. Uh, but we'll see how that kind of plays out. That's going to be really interesting. So the well-capitalized owners will will definitely fare better, uh, and we'll have to see how it kind of works out. Otherwise, these, those assets are uh, extremely liquid, though. So right as we see deals go to market, they're being they're trading at a very high rate. So I'm not too worried about the agency space. Life companies have been incredibly um, conservative as usual right. through through this cycle. And I think they stand to be in a good position. However, they do have significant exposure to office, usually large office, and uh, and, and they tend to be in, in CBDs, right? So uh, I think that office is sort of a, a, a lagging indicator. There's a lot of great credit leases out there. They, they've responded differently than retail has as a whole. So there's, uh, there's going to be a lagging effect. We'll have to see where that goes uh, on the office front. But in general, I think life codes are pretty safe. And then on the CBS, CBS the MBS, excuse me, uh, route. There's, we know that there's some uh, stuff out there. And there's, do you think it's a good time for me to show a good tech tool? You sure. think? Absolutely. Switch over. So here's a little nugget. Many of you all may already know about this, but I figured I, I thought that it'd be really helpful for me to bring it up. And it is DBRS's viewpoint tool. It's totally free. They've been great to me, so I love to give them a plug. Um, and you, from, it's a totally free service. Uh, they've got this great COVID surveillance page, plus a lot of other functionality, uh, enough to keep you busy for sure. Uh, but it's really interesting. They, give you, they have some of these really cool snapshots like special servicer transfer and reason. So now there's about 1700 loans, uh, 1709, uh, earlier this year it was around uh, 1,755. So in many, most of those cases, those deals were transferred back to traditional um, master servicing. So things are getting better. I think more so than they're pushing forward with foreclosure. Uh, and my conversations with you know, BP's owners and uh, special, special services directly, 
you know, they have a lot of forbearance agreements that are out there that are kind of coming due in the next, call it three to six months. And some guys are saying they're losing patience with borrowers. And some they're saying, look, there might be a, a forbearance 2.0. So right. we're going to have to see how that plays out. You know, I think uh, government will play a little bit into that. Uh, but this is a really cool tool. And since this is a tech, uh, a, a tech talk, I thought that I would, uh, it would be a great thing to share. Yeah, it's not what I was familiar with at all. Uh, as I, I think I've mentioned to you before, we actually use TREP to try and track what's going on in the uh, commercial mortgage-backed security market. Right. I think that's a fantastic resource. Uh, and, and it's just, look, it comes down to the economics sometimes. This is a free resource. There's a little bit of functionality that's probably missing, but uh, in general, it's a great overview kind of uh, piece to, to get you into some good conversations. And maybe it's what helps you helps a broker decide uh, or an owner even decide if they want to pay up for, for another service. A free is always good. So, so yeah, look, I, I think there's a lot of great things for us to kind of cover on when it comes to the potential, right? And how things are going. I, one of the things I thought we would cover too is I was talking about the FDIC. Again, ugly slide. I apologize. But when you're pulling something from an Excel spreadsheet, it's uh, uh, maybe I'm just not the best at it. But what I find really interesting is in this yellow box, what you're seeing here, uh, if it's not big enough on your screen, is that even back in 2008, we were looking at a one to one and a half and then kind of spiking into two, per, two, two and a half percent territory on charge offs for all the top banks, top 100 banks in the country. And it wasn't until we saw the real spike in uh, fourth quarter 2009 that, where's my cursor? There it is. Uh, we got to 3.37 and then it's descended from there. And as we got closer, this is exactly what I'm talking about. In the first quarter 2020, we were basically at zero or negative charge off, right? Which is amazing. And we're, you know, 0.02. And so this is quarterly charge offs. And, and it's interesting to know that it's not really happening, wasn't really happening in our space. And so one of the fears is that there's a big rubber band snap the other way, right? Because as these right. things go through cycles, yeah. And so maybe this was an inflection point or maybe there's another inflection point coming, but it's been an incredible expansionary cycle, uh, and and hopefully everyone out there is is riding the roller coaster well. So basically, what you're saying is it's only a fraction of those charge offs today, as there were all the way from 2008 all the way through to the end of 2011. It's a tiny fraction of it, actually. Right. A very tiny. I mean, it's, it's barely even hitting the Richter scale. It's just right. nothing, and so it just speaks to how well things have gone. And you have to think about so. Uh, my next slide is really about the SBA. Again, not a gorgeous slide, but it's data intensive. And, and I feel like sometimes, like I really want people to see that it's, I'm pulling it from the direct source. That's kind of my goal. And, and I, I give up some on, on that. But the, uh, the 7A space, which is hospitality, right? So any SBA loan, the, the loan program for hospitality is, is the 7A uh, uh, moniker there that they give it, uh, or designation, I should say. We're about 100 billion in SBA loans that have been given to hoteliers, right? And so a lot of the hotel, hoteliers that are using this type of financing are not the largest, most liquid folks, right? I think those are probably looking at CMBS loans and, and some other direct bank loans. So I see this as an opportunity for us to sort of uh, be a great advisor and, and help with uh, throughout that process. And the SBA process is a little different, right? And, and but but a lot of these deals, you can go up to, I think 85% is normal, but you can go up to about 105 or roughly around 100% financing when you include FF&E for, mm -hmm. uh, for PIPs. And, uh, so, so these are you know, low, low equity type loans that are out in the, in the marketplace. And so anything that was done, say, 2019, 2018, there are significantly higher valuations going in than, than they would be today. So I think the SBA is going to be a really good space for us to, to kind of focus on. What's interesting too about, I think it was different this go around in the CMBS world is if you notice, uh, here's that space I was talking about earlier about how there was this area of time after the, the, the Great Recession where there was really no traction in one of the, one of the biggest pieces of, um, uh, of the business that provides liquidity to borrowers. But look at that spike in 2007. You're talking about you know, a, a massive, massive amount of business, and it's almost all conduit versus now looking at 2019, less than 50% of the CMBS loans that were written were, were really conduit loans. 
they're mainly these single asset borrower loans, which is a, a stark difference compared to the last cycle. So that'll be interesting too, to see how that plays out. Either way, it's going to create some opportunity as some of these actually fold. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, and then as we all know, and it's lodging and retail, were the first deals to really be on the radar. They got put on watch list immediately. Uh, another thing to note on the CMBS side is that as things move quickly and they move hard and fast, if there's a note that looks like it's going to have a significant fall off, uh, they immediately put it into a, a wait list, even if they're not in default. And so that's kind of what we saw. When you look at this slide here, it's, it's kind of going back uh, right around the begin or mid year last year. Actually, late, yeah, my initial slide was that. So this is like late last year, and it's showing us this a, a big initial spike in, uh, in these assets that needed to be put on a watch list. And many of them weren't even delinquent. So that was interesting too, right? It was a little bit of a, a quick response, maybe quicker than it needed to be. I, but there are going to be some assets that come through the pipeline, and, and we're starting to hear more about that. So. Uh, bankruptcy is another, sorry, there we go. Uh, uh, bankruptcy is another thing that's being talked about a lot. Uh, we haven't seen a, a big move on that. I think government intervention has really helped. So we learned, uh, I think, that from the last recession, that quick, hard moves. Uh, some people are arguing that maybe it's a little too much liquidity in the market. Uh, but it has seemed to stem a lot of the bankruptcies uh, from coming to fruition. In fact, I was speaking with a big, uh, I've been speaking with a lot of bankruptcy attorneys and judges uh, here recently uh, and trying to convince them actually to move to this, this new world of online auctions versus the, the inside the courtroom auction. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I would love any support that you can give me in that cause. I think that you know, COVID gives us a, a unique opportunity to, uh, to introduce ourselves into that um, process a little bit more. Uh, but historically, they've been a little bit more closely held auctions. Well, Sorry, you, go ahead. Mark. You said you're uh, broker friendly or broker centric. Can you kind of walk us through how that works so that uh, the broker remains involved? Because obviously a lot of our viewers are brokers. How that uh, uh, dovetails with brokerage having these online auctions because so many of the uh, online auction houses that opened for residential were trying to disintermediate the, the realtor to get rid of them. So how does this work in tandem with the and, real estate community? Yeah, I think a lot of my competitors are really looking at it the same way. They're looking at disintermediation. I think that's really interesting because to, to me, the, the lifeblood of our business is, uh, and, and you, know, you see it in the equities market, you see it everywhere. Um, the, the broker still drives so much of the business and really moves, makes the big things happen. And that's where we want to be. And uh, so from our perspective, we're not even going direct to clients. So most of my the competitors in the space and the people that uh, they look at this business where they want to have access to the seller. And I get that. I mean, everybody wants more control. Uh, from our perspective, we've been operating in a scenario for 20 years and two and a half trillion dollars of transactions where we've never once asked the, the broker to, to re reveal their seller or even the end buyer, right? So on the auction side, we need to know who the seller is because we're going to be helping to manage some of the contractual things, but we're not part of the contract. We're not uh, engaging with their seller. In fact, the broker engages with us. So our documents are signed um, by the broker to to begin marketing the asset and putting it into an auction. So that's pretty unique to us. Uh, and, and it's just to stay in line with the idea that we want the broker to, to, to really walk away with three things. When I have, when I sit down and, we, when I, and, and do business with, with a broker, I want them to know that they're in control. So if, if we're going in, uh, if we're in a fighter jet, we don't have to be, but if we're in a fighter jet, they're the pilot, I'm the navigator, right? I'm, I'm bringing lots of experience, uh, lots of knowledge of platforms bringing lots of great data to inform them to make great decisions, right? And so ultimately, they're the ones that are going to kind of land the plane. So I, I do, I went out of my way, uh, really, to give the broker so much control and, and an ability to customize uh, the auction for their customer, for their client. And ways that it looks like are, for instance, we don't have set auction dates every two weeks. The broker and the seller need to understand what they need to have happen and when. Why would I try to impose that timetable on them because I, because I control the, the platform? I think that's just, it's not an alignment, right? It's, it's in disalignment. So if, here's a great, for instance, that, that can happen. I've got a, you know, you have your seller, you're, I'm a broker, I have a client, and they need to move on something within a certain period of time, right? They need to have a deliverable to their bank or investor 
uh, of a like maybe it's a, a you know non contingent contract for, of sale uh, to satisfy something that's really motivating them. Well, what if I come back to that person? And I say, well, we can't we can't operate within that time frame. I mean, that's not really serving the customer. Not only the broker it makes the broker look bad, but also um, it, it's not serving our customer in any way, shape, or form. So what we have is this ability to really be uh, flexible and accommodate the different date profiles and marketing timelines for any asset uh, and for any broker that brings us something. So I think that's really powerful. Uh, the same thing is around how they interact with the market. You know, right now, I think what's known out there is you sort of just, you sign up your deal, it gets marketed by your auction auctioneer partner. You really have no visibility into what's going on, when it happens, how it happens. Uh, and, and I've totally flipped that around as well. I want, I want the broker to be intimately involved in sort of our database is, is bifurcated into sort of vetted buyers, which we're really well known for. So we've got about 75,000 fully vetted commercial real estate investors that we actually know exactly what they're looking for. We interact with them. We know that they're active in the markets. We have a full team of people that all they do is follow up with these buyers. And I think that's, it's a really big uh, part of why we've been so successful so long with brokers. So I want to give them access to that. And then I also want to allow them to uh, really maximize the exposure for the deal by also tapping into our non-vetted customers, right? That might be, there's various reasons why they not, might not be vetted. One, maybe they don't want to be vetted, but most do, uh, or they just don't have the uh, capacity to really make it onto our more principal only list. So they have the ability to sort to, to bifurcate our database and really understand who the assets are going to. Uh, they can look and see, oh, this gentleman or or lady received the email but didn't open it. They should have. Let me call them because you know they really need to see this asset. Uh, that type of thing. They can interact with our database really well. And then we also have a massive about a hundred thousand uh, broker database. So when it comes to being collaborative and you know allowing brokers to bring their buyers or the best buyers to the market as well. It's really a, a, a super wide um, marketing platform that's totally customizable for brokers to give them and their clients the best experience. So um, I really like that a lot. And, and I feel good about saying that to the brokerage community. How much uh, you know? does, I don't know if you can talk about this or not, but how much does it cost if we're doing, uh, if we're at uh, Cushman Wakefield or we're branded uh, uh, Central Twenty One commercial uh, site through uh, RCM? What's the the cost factor if I want to bring a, a ten million dollar asset to market using RCM? So on the auction side, there's no there's no upfront fee. Um, we will pay. We'll actually invest in your deal, right? We'll provide photos if you need. Most most brokers are bringing their own photos to the deal. They they tend to do that as a service already. But to the extent that they want that or to uh, layer in some drone video uh, or whatever might make the asset look great for uh, online. We'll do that. We'll also order the third parties, as I mentioned earlier, and, and eat that cost. So the way that works is if we if the deal doesn't sell at auction, which is pretty rare, uh, then we eat those costs. That's how much we're willing to invest, you know, into the deal and into them. Uh, and if it does trade at auction, then um, you know there's a, there's typically a cost at closing where we get reimbursed for for being successful with them. But from a bigger perspective, uh, we're we're actually working out splits with every major provider and, and every broker on our actual, um, on our buyer's premium, which is what's paid by the buyer above and beyond their winning bid price customarily. So Got it. we are fully going in as partners on these deals. And that, that makes me really excited to say and proud to say. Nice. Can you kind of walk us through, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but can you kind of walk us through how the process works, uh, how a, a deal gets put together? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here I can stop sharing some of this. There's some good other data in there, but um, you know, the, the first thing, and, and so I, I mentioned there was three things I, I would like to have kind of hit with the, when I hit with the broker is it's control, the, the ability to customize. And the, the last thing is to open up a dialogue. And so to me, the dialogue works like this. It's, it's a deal-based dialogue. So it's no strings attached and co totally confidential, send me your deal to help you evaluate it for an auction. So we've got all kinds of services that you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna leave our, our communication for the better for sure, one way or another. And, and what that looks like is we're gonna pull preliminary title, title report. So we'll, like, it won't pick up all the municipal liens. 
necessarily or mechanic liens, but it's going to show if there's a, kind of a clean, a uh, clean bill of title there, or chain of title, I should say. So we're, we're doing that up front for free as part of an evaluation of any deal, and we're running a pilot program right now where we'll pull sort of a, a quick look desktop phase one. So look, it's not engineer stamped, it isn't, but from our database and, and from what, uh, what we have access to, we can kind of give you a feel if there's reason to pause, right? I mean, maybe there's, there might be a note on the file around a gas station that's uphill and a mile away, and that might affect you know, your parcel or not. And so if, if anything, it just gives the broker a little bit more strength when they go back for either their BOV or to pitch the auction process. They have much more knowledge around the deal. We'll also run, uh, some cash flow models and things like that, some comp models from maybe similar deals that we've sold or been a part of selling that we haven't really sold anything, brokers sell them, um, and just give some more data and information around uh, the deal that we think might be valuable, including how many bidders we might be able to get on, on a deal or how many buyers would be in the database that they would be communicating with. Uh, all things that I think are really important for uh, a broker to have sort of in their duffel bag uh, to, as they go and they, they speak with their seller and, and try and stand out and win business. It's a very competitive market out there. And so I, I want to help support the brokers that support me. So that's step one, the evaluation process. Uh, and look, I want to win. I, I'm, I'm into doing a lot of volume and I'm in, into winning a lot. So when we look at deals, we go through a fine tooth comb. We're not trying to do every deal. Not every deal is an auction deal. Some deals would be better set to go to our RCM core product first to go to the market. Uh, because if a seller is not really motivated, it might not be the right time yet. Right. Motivation is one of the key components around having a successful auction. True. So uh, once we, we get to the evaluation process, uh, we have our engagement reading, uh, our engagement documents. We have to get through that, which is pretty simple. It's straightforward, giving us an opportunity to be the, the marketing platform for the broker uh, and agreeing to some of the terms and conditions up front for the auction. Because not only are we creating an environment where the buyer needs to perform the seller needs to perform too we all need to perform right in any transaction so it's uh it's pretty fair i think to, to make sure that we can execute it's fair to the buyers for all the work that they do on the front end to underwrite these deals if, if they're going to spend that time and, and commitment and register for the auction we want to know that they have something that's deliverable and, and and i trust that our brokers appreciate that as well so our typical marketing cycle is you know four to six weeks i think it's probably more than six weeks Right, and so it takes about a week or so to get a, a site up and live. There's, uh, they can interact. Most folks, I'm imagining, that has, have worked with us that are uh, in your alumni group here. Uh, they understand how our platform works, and it's very similar on the auction side. They can upload their photos. We've got custom templates for every major brokerage shop. We've also got non-custom. You know, they can kind of pick from independents as well, uh, and it's built out with all their colors, their brand, their logo, their name. Uh, we're nowhere. We're at the very bottom and it kind of just says par powered by real capital markets, right? This is really all about the broker and it goes to our, our decentralized model. So from there, they get these gorgeous landing pages. Uh, Laura, were you expecting, you want me to show some of this stuff? Do you think that'd be helpful? If you, yeah. If you have a couple of minutes. Sure. Yeah. It's, yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Maybe I can walk, walk everybody through that and it might be helpful. So this is our backend portal, uh, near and dear to many of our, our, our broker customer uh, clients. And so here's an example of an email uh, that, that goes out. These are obviously in a browser, you'd see it actually in your email. Um, and you have call to actions here, button for buyers. It's gonna kind of push through. I think I have, whoops, right here. So we'll show our main site. It's gonna be very similar. Obviously this is a demo. I don't wanna give away any sensitive information. Uh, this is a demo site, but they're, it's gorgeous, right? And it's, it's one of the reasons why you know, people or brokers come to us over and over again to take deals out. But from here, the call to action is to, to view the confidentiality agreement. You can use your own or you can use ours. It's very simple. You know, click, click, and agree. Obviously, they need to review. And it brings us to our virtual deal room. Uh, this is actually a really big selling point. I think you know, the more that people know about this, the better. Our, our virtual deal room is, has bank level security. And so in this, in this age where everyone's talking about cybersecurity, I can't think of anything that would be more important to most institutional customers, really any customer, but it's gotta be on top of mind really for everyone that's out there. And so 
you know, our bank level, um, our bank level security is utilized by the FDIC, the SBA, and and just tons and tons and tons of of large banks, between about 1,100 banks, because they trust that they can use our virtual deal room to house documents and uh, also partition it. So it's one thing for it to be secure. The other thing is being able to control who can see what and when. And it goes back to the control piece, right? So knowing that uh, known buyers can maybe see everything, right? Where maybe uh, non-known buyers to you, you want them just to see your offering memorandum first and to get to know them before releasing more sensitive data. It's just a lot of power that we're not seeing elsewhere in the industry, right? And it's a, it's a reason why people come back to us. And there's also, as we were talking about note sales, I think one of the most interesting things that's out there that really hasn't been discussed is we have the ability to run more of like a closed auction. And so why that might be valuable uh, to a bank is maybe they don't want everyone to know they're selling off a particular tranche of, of notes or any particular note. And so while you can market it kind of widely, when the auction day comes, uh, we can shut it down to where only the people that are registered can watch the bidding take place. And I think that could be powerful for some sellers, especially ones that are uh, concerned about maybe airing out their dirty laundry right in front of everyone, right? This is a, it's a great way to sort of uh, put the buyer in a position, I'm sorry, the seller in a position to keep it a little closer to the vest, but still democratize the process and give the buyers that qualify for the asset an opportunity to bid. And so one of the ways we can do that here is, this is a specific bid page just for this buyer. They have their own unique bid page. So we don't have to have a centralized page that everyone can see. It can be a really closed down just to the folks that we want to have be able to watch the auction. So here they can submit bids. Uh, it goes by increment. They can actually type in their own their own incre their own bid and it has to just be above you know that that initial increment here. So um, of course, of course it's a demo and it's going to give me a, an error, but uh, that's okay. Here's where the, th this is where the technology I think really stings for brokers when they want to manage that like that final auction day, which is where look that's where we make our money. It's where a lot of stress can happen. Everything happens at the end. It's not eBay, you know. Any bids that come in under two minutes, like uh, the two minute warning in football, we add three minutes. So they don't do that in football, but they do have a two minute warning. Uh, so we add three minutes. So for instance, the bid comes in at a minute and thirty seconds left on the clock. We now have four minutes and 30 seconds and the clock continues to count down. And that's because look, we're not selling, uh, we're, not, we're not selling Pokemons on eBay, right? Where it doesn't really matter and someone can just sneak in and click with that last second. That's happened to me so many times. Uh, where here, we're talking about multi-million dollar assets. So we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to make their best and final offer. Uh, or like I like to put it, that you know, the market has an unlimited best and final offers. So we have that capability. On our platform, the broker, again, has control of the auction board. So my team is trained up. We're in a position, again, as the navigator, we'll run this auction, run the auction board on the back end. So the brokers typically want to be on the phone with buyers. They typically want to be you know, pushing buyers and giving feedback to their seller and not necessarily worried about clicking, uh, about changing increments, about managing the auction. So we'll do that. However, we are the only provider out there that does give the broker the opportunity to do that. So, you know, they can control increments right here as well as, you know, reserve. Um, and they also have this, what's really interesting is they have this kind of pop out where they can track not only who's on the deal, who's fully registered. They can also do fun stuff like say uh, Yvonne here. Let's say Yvonne, we're like, I thought she only submitted 10 million in proof of funds. Why does it say 12.5? Did somebody kind of fat finger it or have make a mistake? And, and so we say, all right, look, let's look real quick and see, you know, what are, her, what are the proof of funds? Again, this is demo data, but this would be a PDF of their bank statement. And it would say 12 and a half million. Oh, I made a mistake. That's right. She did submit 12 and a half million. Great. Because remember, things are happening fast as the clock ticks down. The other thing that's really interesting and, and, and we're the only, uh, I think it's unique to us is, let's say here we have Amanda Frank. She's been saying all week she's going to get her proof of funds in to, to compete in the auction. Uh, and for whatever reason, she hasn't been able to. But it just turns out that Amanda is a fantastic client of the broker, and they have total trust in her capability to close on the deal. 
And so they say, they call Amanda, there's about a minute left in the auction. They say, Amanda, uh, you know, what's going on? And she convinces them in, in, in her way that she's ready to go. She'd love to bid and that she's good for the money. And they decide that that's what they want to do. They go ahead and they block the requirement. Now Amanda can bid, right? So it's, it's really giving the, the broker this, this piece of, you know, really piloting the auction if they want to. And, you know, the phone number's there. Everything you need is right here at your fingertips. So when, when time is of the essence, it's great to have a really well thought out process and user interface. For, for all of us that are looking to, you know, to, to produce on auction day. Do you see this uh, uh, type of platform, online auctions for commercial real estate increasing in the future, taking a larger percentage of the uh, CRE deals that are happening? Or do you think this is something that uh, may have reached its peak? Well, of course, you have a company that is doing it. So, you know, I might be asking the wrong person. <laughs> I might be probably, yeah. Yeah, no, you're asking the actually the right person, Lauren. I uh, I'm very realistic. I think one of the things that that has plagued the growth of this of this tool is sort of being stuck in an old way of thinking. And I don't mean I mean that by the actual people who are creating these uh, these platforms. So I like to think of myself as very much a forward thinker. And and so there's there's a lot of things that we're you're going to see coming out. Like when you mentioned earlier about Lightbox looking to become more or less like an exchange or having that kind of data and be able to move quickly and providing what, what that looks like for the commercial real estate industry. Uh, I'm evolving some products for brokers that we're going to be test piloting here in the next six to 12 months that are much more targeted towards uh, non-distressed assets. So we're going to be toying with, uh, think about like the CBOE, uh, when you think about commodities trading. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges in commodities trading was was really creating the standardized models so that you could that you could trade them right so you know for stock they charge in 100 unit lots or 100 100 share lots very similar on the cboe which is very different per whether it's pork bellies or uh, soybeans right but they had to come down to really dumb it down in the sense so to trading blocks tradable blocks we're going to be doing some very similar things to that that i think will really open up and then, and, then, and then lowering the barrier to entry on the cost side, right? So as things are a little bit more, uh, like for instance, the single tenant net lease space, right? A Walgreens deal that's in um, say Bethlehem, Pennsylvania uh, versus here in Miami where I am, they're actually, if they have similar lease terms, they're gonna trade pretty close when it comes to cap rate right. in the open market, right? So. If there was a way that very much like a stock, right? You're looking at bid ask spreads, and there's some different things to think about there. I think there's a we're working on uh, launching this product where we'll be able to bring the auction interface at a much reduced cost, right, for volume, and open up the single tenant at lease space. So I'm really excited about that. It's in its infancy, so you know, bear with us. But we'd love feedback from from your folks. You know, highly educated. Uh, I know, and, and, and working with and going to Lehigh and so I want to hear feedback on that. I'd love to share some ideas more offline uh, because it is a little bit my baby. Uh, and so you're hearing it here first from a large national standpoint. But those are the things that are going to take it really from a tool just for distress and sort of only in these parts of the cycle to really extrapolating it throughout the cycle and making it a mainstay uh, in, a bro in a broker's toolbox. Sure, absolutely. Now, you talked about Lightbox a little bit. Um... What are they trying to ultimately accomplish as they pull this stuff together? Uh, so we are, again, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's certainly not like fireworks going off when you talk about workflows, right? It's just not, but, but that's really what we're at. We're building this, a workflow engine for all of commercial real estate, right? And I think the end game there is to then utilize all that backend data, all like have our tentacles really within all throughout uh, the business to where we're helping to really push things forward and help the professionals make decisions faster, which will help, you know, our clients make decisions faster, which will then lead to more of this uh, frictionless market that we see in, in other places but, and bring that to commercial real estate. So the buyers who are purchasing a lot of these assets, uh, are many of them institutional investors or are they just uh, parties that have a lot of cash? It's a big mix. It's a big mix. And actually about 50 to 60% of transactions close with debt. It's just on cash terms. Mm -hmm. So many times that means there's bridge lenders involved or private lenders involved. Uh, but, but typically there are 
uh, lenders involved. However, it's deemed a cash transaction, but you know, it's all over the board. And you know, there's some things that we're doing here uh, at Lightbox to accommodate the different buyer groups. So when I look at private capital, I think in a lot of ways that's that sort of you know zero to two million and then sort of zero to five million, right? There's there's some striations there within that grouping. Then you sort of go from like seven to twelve million tends to be a little bit of a of an awkward spot. You've got private capital that doesn't tend to have fully to do a cash transaction may not be have enough cash to do a ten million dollar transaction and close quickly like that. Uh, and then you, so how do we bridge that gap, right? And then there's this f- sort of 15 million and up where we start getting the more institutional capital where uh, there's there's some other challenges there around their buying style, right? And I think that's a great question I've gotten many times. And so there are institutions that are buying in the auction platform and there's gonna be more. You know, what's really interesting about this cycle is that, I don't know about you, but every day I wake up and I read about a new debt fund that, uh, or a new fund, distressed fund that's opened up and all of those funds are built to buy from auctions, but you know the, the his, historically, the cadence of a of an institutional buyer is LOI credit committee contract, right? right. And close. So the auction doesn't really fit into that in that way. And so there's some things that we're doing, again, forward thinking to construct an, an opportunity, construct a playing field where institutions can play ball across the board. And I think that's really important, right? And so there are a lot of institutions that already do play uh, on our auctions, but there will be more in the future. And I think that we have, we go back to that sort of seven to $12 million sort of buyer sec. We speak to that market more than anybody, right? It, we're, we're doing about 50% of the market share of those assets and marketing those assets. So uh, that's, that's really a place that we love to compete in. And then on the, on the bottom side, there's a lot of liquidity we, we look to bring, and it's a big part of my business model, is to bring a ton of liquidity into that under $2 million space from an auction standpoint. And so it's a big volume game. It's like looking at tertiary uh, secondary markets. It's looking at assets you know, below, certainly below a million. There's a big push for absolute auctions. We've got some great partners at CBRE that are helping us really launch that. Uh, I can certainly give them a, a bit of a shout out here, Phil Cates and, and Adam Slaver. Uh, they're ex colleagues of mine, and we've really been pushing the space, and, and really them on their shoulders, pushing that space further and further, and and bringing uh, liquidity into markets that may not be getting that kind of attention. And I think that really every everybody that uh, in viewership today should be thinking about that market, and how they can uh, optimize their business by bringing in a lot of these more uh, these transactions that have a lot of certainty around them, because uh, those that certainty turns into certain paychecks, and and I think that's what we're all about. You'd said that you evaluate whether or not something should go to auction. Do you have a a feel for what percentage of deals brought you actually make it into the uh, auction wheelhouse or uh, how many that uh, get turned back down because they're not quite ready to uh, go through that process? So it's, you know, it's fine. It's a great question. I I don't really, what I like to look at it as is we're not looking to turn deals down. What we're trying to do is educate the uh, the broker on where we think the market might materialize and then listen to them. I mean, ultimately, they know the deal better than we do. They know the customer better than we do. And they know the, that that particular market better than we do. You know, we're running, I'm running a national business. There's markets that I, I know a lot about, but there's also a ton of markets that I don't. So when they bring us the deal, uh, that's why I really try to make a robust uh, response with, you know, title and the this thing we're doing with the phase, you know, pre-phase one, desktop phase ones, um, uh, this whole thing of kind of putting cash flow models together, bringing up comps, what have we done in the market? How large is our database? So they have really like a, like a dossier of information that they can make a better decision about. And so like, there's a deal I'm talking to right now. It's, a, it's basically a, a 12 and a half to $13 million hotel deal. And I'm speaking with the broker and the seller and they're like, well, we want the reserve to be, you know, 13 million. And I'm like, okay, well, if it's me and you sitting down having coffee together, eyeball to eyeball, is that a real number? Is that a real number for this asset? Is that something that you could, you in your heart of hearts believe we can have three or four active investors after reserves met still bidding on this deal? And so at the end of the day, it, that's that's the kind of conversations that I'm having. And, and if the answer is no, then the the broker is sort of saying, look, maybe it's not the right time. You know, maybe it's not the right asset. Maybe we need to come back. And I'm fine with that. For for me, it's a it's I want to I want to see them be successful. So 
So uh, the best I can do is be the navigator and give them the information they need to make the right decision. Understood. Does anybody on uh, our webinar today have any questions you might want to throw at us? I didn't see anything else in the chat box popping up, but I'll give you a minute to put something in. While we're doing that, uh, Justin, anything else you'd like to add to what we've discussed so far today? Um, no, look, I think this has been very comprehensive. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think that, you know, overall, I, I, I feel like your viewer base um, should feel free to reach out to us. If they've got contacts at, at Real Capital Markets or if they want to reach out to me directly, they absolutely can. Uh, as you can tell with me, it's, it's conversational. Uh, I've got a lot of deal savvy and we can talk through a lot of these things together and, and again, put them in a position to win. That's really why, um, that's why we're here. Uh, I do see some good questions coming in. Uh, one about uh, independent uh, brokers. Absolutely. We love independent brokers too. Uh, I'd love to know, you know more about you and what you're doing and the, and the volume and kind of uh, where the deal flow is coming from and uh, see how we can kind of set up a system to, uh, to, to support you as you grow your business. And like you, you got to love the auction, really. It, it, what, it's interesting to me. The auction took me, uh, and, I, and I've been in and around the business in a lot of different ways. I can say I've done everything but title. Uh, but uh, it took me a, a, quite a bit of time to really learn the auction, right? And a lot of transactions and a lot of learning from others. And it, it, you can get into this business. It's a really niche piece that will, will drive a lot of revenue for you. I highly encourage it. If you had to make a prediction for uh, the future, for the end of the year, you, it sounds like your expectation is we're not going to see the same uh, asset challenges, even with uh, the whole mess that COVID's created, the same type of receivership at the end of this year as we might have seen back in 2009, 2010, into 2011. Yeah, I don't see it being quite as extreme, but I definitely think there's more. Now I feel like there's more people on the optimist side than there was obviously six months or eight months ago. And it's like this rubber band thing, right? So I do think there's more of a down the middle. There's going to be some challenges that come up. I think the way, like for instance, about two weeks ago, all the major banks decided they were going to release the, the money they had in reserve for, for bad CRE loans because they want to up their numbers for right. to, to show more profit over the next couple of quarters. But what's interesting is I thought they were so smart last year when they put a big chunk of money away and they didn't even need to. They actually exceeded their reserve requirements. And so it's really interesting to me that right now they're making that move because they've got about two quarters to sort of maybe push profits and look really good, but they're going to have to reckon with that coming into late Q3 and in definitely into Q4. So I think that'll be interesting how that plays out. I think we're distinctly wide open for maybe another reverberation, right? Whether it be with COVID or something else, you know, we've kind of fired the money cannon as much as we, maybe not as much as we can, but we're getting there. So it's like, I don't know what other remedies we might have at that point if we did have some, some, some sort of other inflection point come up. So I remain positive. Uh, I, I talked to a lot of the major banks and, and, and funds. And so I've asked them that question. I've said, okay, well, what happens if we have another black swan event of some sort or another issue? And you know, what's your contingency? Because a lot of them are remaining very, very positive and optimistic. Uh, with the operators that they've chosen, right, on the loans that they've made. Uh, and and for the most part, it's sort of like, well, we're in trouble if we have another you know, I don't know, undulation, we'll call it, <laughs> inflection point, all these great words. Um, and so that that to me is kind of what's on the horizon. That's what I'm looking for is what does that look like? And, um, you know, we I feel like we we tend to naturally as humans and, and be optimistic about things. We forget about the bad stuff. And I, I, I'm not going to take my off that ball. That's for sure. You know, it's funny. I've, all the bankers I've been talking to have been saying the same thing. They're not real concerned. They don't see this uh, wave coming. That's going to be a problem. But I'll tell you, if I were a, a mid-sized bank or a small bank that heavily lended to the uh, lodging industry, I'd be a little concerned. So, right. It, it, there's just so many losses mm -hmm. that they're going to have to make up that I'm curious where that's going to end up. And so some of those things might look like debt coverage ratio issues, right? So like in a lot of the deals that I'm looking at, they used to get 25 bucks a foot net. Now they're getting 18 or asking 18. I mean, unfortunately, there's a, an office building I was looking at the other day uh, in the Midwest. It used to be a $27 million asset. They were hoping to get 19, 20, but now they're effective. They're asking rents. They went from an effective rent of say 26 on average, full service gross 
down to asking 13. That's a major difference. Right. And so their ability to, to continue to, you know, once we move through this period and, and the rules are back in play, assuming that that happens, um, they're going to be in a tough spot to kind of make up that difference and, and be and get back within the loan covenant. So the question is going to be, are we going to still be in this compassionate capitalism, as we kind of called it in our most recent research report that we just put out? Or is there eventually, you know, our, our elbow is going to get sharp right. from the banks? uh carrie asked uh what do you think the will be the impact of the mortgage moratorium expiring it's more on the residential side but do you have a feel for that look i, I think that it will all play to to the consumer and the, the ability for the consumer to continue to spend right so i think that's going to be where that's where i think it will affect and impact us is, is how people react to that you know when the stimulus checks stop if they do when um, when bills come due. And I think on the renter side, it's really big. When we talk about 60, $70 billion, that's money that's going into pri typically private capital, private owners, right? That are, that are in arrears like that. So how is that going to resolve itself? I don't really understand it. And, and so I have to imagine that it's going to impact consumers either through their credit and their inability to make good on that past year, uh, or the landlords are just going to have to eat that. That's a big number to sort of just absolve, right? And so that's going to be really, it's going to be really unique to this situation, especially because, you know, Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac have been really complicit in a lot of that. And, and I guess complicit has a negative connotation, but I just mean that they've been part and parcel of saying, hey, we'll give you forbearance if you, you know, kind of comply with these eviction issues. So um, it has to affect us at some point. I just don't know if it's going to be in six to 12 months or, you know, 60 years. True. Gonna, it'll have to play out. All right. I think uh, that's all we've got for questions. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being Great. part of this today and uh, giving us your insights and, of course, uh, a look into um, RCM, the uh, the product that you have, as well as the concept of online real estate auctions for CRE is just growing by leaps and bounds, of course. And as I said, there are other firms trying to get into that space because it's been so successful. So we'll see what the future brings in in. Uh, the technology factor in how we're applying the uh, the sales of CRE assets, how we're applying it to the sales of CRE assets. Well, look, I want to thank you again for for having me. This has really been a joy, Lauren. You're great. This is uh, I love the back and forth and, and the questions from the the crowd. And uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to me at, at any time, uh, whether whether it be you, Lauren, or anyone else in, in the audience. Uh, and and know that I'm very appreciative of the opportunity um, to speak with your audience. So thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.